Hello, namaste. Uh, I welcome our speakers and participants watching us via Facebook page on this webinar. Today, we will be discussing about role of men in advocating urgency of dignified menstruation in the era of 2030 agenda. Dignified menstruation is a holistic approach to address all kinds of violence and discrimination associate, associated with menstruation. In order to combat and eliminate all forms of discrimination and violence against women, the dialogue on dignified menstruation is crucial. My name is Samiksha Koirala. I'm Kathmandu Best, a gender and media researcher. And I would like to begin this webinar with a short introduction of our speakers, and then we'll uh, begin the discussion Meanwhile, please feel free to write down if you have any questions, suggestions, recommendation in this topic. We will try our best to address these. And uh, we have, as you can see on the screen, we have Karmaji and Lakshmanji today. Uh, Mr. Karma Wanchuk is joining us from Bhutan, and uh, Lakshman Belvasis is joining us from the USA. Uh, Karma Wanchuk is a father of one girl, and he is currently working at Ministry of Education in Bhutan. He holds a master's degree in management from University of Canberra. He has more than two decades of working in education sector. And we are also happy to introduce Mr. Wangchuk as a menstrual activist, as he is a part of a Red Dot campaign, uh, Red Dot Bhutan campaign that is working towards normalizing menstrual taboos and myths. He's also advocating on the area of menstrual hygiene. That is definitely one of the pillars of dignified menstruation. And he, as I told you, he has also more than two decades of working in the education sector. So he will definitely have a lot to share with us today. Uh, next we have, as I told you before, Mr. Lakshman Belvasi. He is a co-director of Men Engage Alliance. Lakshmanji is a gender justice and child right activist with all almost two decades of experience working with various uh, human rights, NGOs and INGOs across the globe. Uh, he has been working mainly in the area of gender equality and justice and uh, transforming masculinities and working with boys and men in gender justice. Mr. Belbase is a founding poor member of Men Engage Alliance Nepal and he has already served as a regional coordinator of Men Engage Alliance South Asia. He is also a part-time professional lecturer on masculinities in international affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University. And he has, and to my knowledge, I know that he has also been working very closely with the Global South Coalition for a Dignified Menstruation. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so before uh, I uh, start today's dialogue, for those of you who do not know about dignified menstruation, let me begin with a sharing of brief history. Uh, the campaign on dignified menstruation, it did back to four years ago when the Ministry of Water Supply formed a committee for policing uh, for policy drafting on dignified menstruation. And in 8th of December 2019, then Minister uh, Parvat Guru, Ministry of Women, Children and Senior Citizen. He endorsed December 8 as Dignified Menstruation, a day for 16 days activism. And he also announced that Nepal should be a country free of menstrual states and it should be a country of dignified menstruation. And he, along with the Global South Coalition of Dignified Menstruation, has been calling upon the global community to join this campaign to end all sorts of menstrual discrimination. And following this partnership um, with the ministry, Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation, has been organizing a series of uh, events mainly to promote dignified menstruation. So let's focus on today's topic for now. Uh, role of men in advocating urgency of dignified menstruation in the in the era of 2030 agenda. Before we enter into this thought topic, as both of you are male speakers speaking today, speaking on dignified menstruation, it might be interesting to share uh, how you got involved in this campaign and what makes you feel like menstruation is not simply ladies' business. Lakshmanji, let's start from you. Thank you so much, Sajid. Thank you, Karmaji. And thank you for the organizers for inviting us. Um, so for me, I think, you know, my involvement comes from the understanding that 
menstruation nor anything to do with women's body is only women's business it's everyone's business um, and it relates to who we are how our relationships around us but I, even more than that is also because it's a human rights business uh, and that means everyone around the world uh, irrespective of where they come from what identities they have the bodily structure and and processes they have in um, uh, everyone have equal right mm -hmm. to live a life free of discrimination and any forms of violence so for me it's very personal um, <clears throat> because of our experiences i'm originally from nepal as well and we have a lot of uh, issues or um, you know sort of stigma around this you know body of women in general but when it comes to maturation there is even higher tendency to sort of look at the body as purity uh, versus impurity kind of a trajectory which is on itself a very wrong philosophy to start with and it is established because of the existing norms around women or women's rights or body on gender equality and that it requires everyone to be involved in order to address this uh, problem and that's why uh, yeah, I thought that there is a role and responsibility that I need to play as a, as a male identified individual to, to sort of address the root causes of the stigma and discrimination that women are facing just because of this natural phenomena that happens. Uh, and also mm -hmm. because of, which is the foundation of, of our being, for you know, very importantly. So yeah, I thought that responsibility and started being involved in this, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Definitely, we need more people like you uh, in this campaign. And now I would like to go towards Karmazi. And uh, as many of us might not be aware, could you also please share the situation of menstrual stigmas in Bhutan? And also please let us know how did you get involved in this campaign to end the menstrual taboos? Uh, uh... Kuzu Zangpo, uh, greetings uh, from Bhutan, uh, please blessed by His Majesty the King. And uh, uh, to all the viewers here today, uh, uh, a very, very big Kuzu Zangpo actually. Kuzu Zangpo is normally a greetings uh, in a Buddhist uh, way actually. And uh, thank you Lapsamanji and Samikshaji uh, to, uh, for having, uh, having us uh, here, here again. Um, definitely, uh, when it comes to my position as uh, the, the worker for the Red Dot Bhutan, so I got connected uh, to this program a year ago. Uh, basically, as uh, Shamik Saji clearly mentioned, that I was a teacher for the last 20 years and I worked at, as the education officer for a few years. Then now I'm in the school health and nutrition division in Bhutan, where one of the components of my task is normalizing in the uh, way. Uh, we are at our level in our country, although we don't have too much of taboos or the, uh, the looking down on the menstruation, but at times people feel that, like in, in many other countries, people feel like having a menstruation is a little abnormal. So basically we are trying to normalize all the situation of such kind actually. And even in the social media, even in the mainstream media, we are trying to make a propaganda. We are, we are trying to see men can play a bigger role. Here, if you are to look at why uh, women, when they feel bad, it's because of the man. And who is looking down on them? It's because of the man. So man, instead of supporting, so we should work together to normalize it. And on other way, there are a lot of, like if you are to look at the SDGs, three, four, five, six, eight, 12 agenda, we see that uh, we talk a lot about equality, equity and uh, women, even, even we talk about the sustainability, we talk about the inclusion, inclusiveness. So globally, we already have agenda in place at our level. How can we do to contribute to normalize all these things in a small way, actually? So that, I think, uh, interested me to work on it. So as Shamik Shaji mentioned, in Bhutan, we are seriously working into um, the Red Dot Bhutan campaign, and uh, we, have, we are gaining a momentum in our own small way, actually. 
Thank you, Amit Sajji. That's please. very Thank nice you. to know, Karamaji. And definitely, you are in a very important position. Being at the ministry, you can definitely make a lot of difference. And we definitely look forward to us working with you. And in this morning, sure. I was reading one of um, the research article from India uh, that was on role of men uh, in ending menstrual stigma. And it just said that um, the men, most of them have been offered often very surprised, puzzled about the menstruation cycle, and they have been part of, you know, constructing uh, taboos and superstition. And even, uh, so men are also one of the driving uh, factors around taboos and myths around menstruation, uh, because they haven't been able to figure it out like a basic biological phenomenon, uh, like why the periodical emission of fluid happens and why it is not related to any sort of injury. Uh, so um, there have been also a lot of incidents that study suggested that men, uh, uh, they don't try to understand about menstruation, but most of them, when they don't understand it, they just want to make fun out of it. They just want to bully menstruators. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask both of you, like, what was your first experience? Because with menstruators, it's like they get their menstruation and they know about it or they uh, uh, their mothers or their sisters talk about it and they know about it. And I think even in Bhutan and Nepal, it's not very normal that we talk about it in our household. So how did you know about it? Was it through your textbook? So could you please share the, like a small uh, experience that might be interesting? Any one of you, Lakshman, you can go first. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, my experience is from my own lived uh, experience rather than reading. Um, even though, yes, uh, you know, I come from biology background in my education. So obviously we we would, you know, read about what happens to women's body during you know, the adolescence phase and, and the body changes that usually happen. But I think, you know, in the, um, rather than education, I guess the stigma and discrimination are more prevalent in our daily lives. And, and I have been observing that since my childhood within my own family as well. No, I think we have in Nepal this practice of uh, when any women or girls start maturating, then they are kind of put on the side and, yeah, and they are considered, uh, you know, sort of, um, it is a very derogatory, or... exactly. You know, Tom mm -hmm. even to use like you know they become untouchable, untouchable in, in literal right. tense, right? That's true. Um, so, you know, I, I I was you know sort of always uncomfortable with that kind of saying that my mom is untouchable. You know, exactly. I, I was always com you know sort of confused as to understand what exactly that means. But I guess I think that was part of the culture, and 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 that's where everything. Then you you wouldn't question that. Because then it, you are questioning the culture, that means you are questioning the whole power structure that revolves around the, the society, the family, the way we are structured. But I think, you know, as we moved on, I started realizing uh, more and more that this is a malpractice rather than a genuine practice of why women would, you know, sort of be put aside from their work. And then there was a myth around that. I, I'm now recalling, you know, sort of, even though we, we, the, the culture says women need to be uh, in isolation during those four period, four days. But then I think what usually happens is then and everything else, everyone will be running towards her to ask. No, So there is no absolute rest in such, but or isolation right. as such. But right. it's just an isolation in the, the, the um, what is it called? It's just a notion that uh, mm -hmm. someone is isolated but actually all the time people are running to her to ask something in the kitchen or do something because she is the one who primarily has been looking after the household work and then someone is taking care of so in that sense there is no isolation but there is a notion of being in isolation which on in itself yeah. is also a kind of a phenomenon and I always used to be puzzled with it no? and then that's how I started exploring and learning more about why this is happening and it has roots, it's complicated. It has roots in the religion, it has roots in the culture. And this is not only the issue of uh, Nepal or Bhutan, it is a global issue. It, this kind of stigma and discrimination and wrong practices exist around the world. I currently am in the US and I see that happening, even though 
the nature varies from what, what usually takes place mm. in Nepal and Bhutan or South Asia. But the practice of isolation, considering that it's impure body at that point in time, do exist in the so-called developer Western countries as well. And that's how being part of this work that I'm doing with men and boys, I started being more involved and understanding what actually the, and we'll come back to this as well, the Definitely. root of why this is happening. And that's how I, I got mm -hmm. to be more interested and involved in this. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, Lakshmanji mm -hmm. has also stressed that this is definitely not the problem of Bhutan and Nepal. Like, since both of you are representing, I'm asking like some of your experience mm -hmm. on the basis of these countries, but we will definitely come to the broader mm -hmm. issue that this is a global issues and there are definitely different forms of menstrual description. It might not be like just the you know, reason that, okay, in some parts of Nepal, like okay, women are being sent to menstrual shades there are other forms of menstrual discriminations that is definitely not getting attention. And we definitely need uh, more and more people to talk about it. So Karmaji, let's start uh, from you. Like, do you also have like similar kind of menstrual uh, discriminations in Bhutan? How was your experience while growing up? Uh, Shamiksha ji, I have to make, I, I'll make a clear stand here. A human uh -huh. color woman, who works hard to keep every household uh, family members fit for 30 days. If we are to look down on them for five days because of their menstruation, I think we cannot be called as a man actually. Men are said to be very thoughtful. Men are said to be more human. So at times it's a little sad to hear such situation actually, but we do respect to the Nepalese culture. So, but we don't have a sort of a, a Chaubandi culture uh, in uh, the Bhutan, oh, but uh, mm -hmm. for sure, for sure, we have uh, the uh, our own share of complications. Especially as the young boy growing up in the schools, we would tease the girls when they have the menstruation, and uh, uh, we would often our mom and elder sisters when they have a menstruation during the menstruation period, they would not go to the altar where we uh, make offerings every morning. So those are the culture that we grew, uh, I grew up actually, and every uh, Buddhist grew up actually. So uh, basically, although we don't have a serious stigmatizing culture in our society, but at times people feel that menstruation is dirty and menstruation, mm -hmm. when, people, when women, when they have menstruation, they, I think uh, they even, Sometimes they are looked uh, looked down, and at it in some part of their country towards the south, uh, people I think they are not allowed to uh, go into the kitchen. Though they are not allowed to touch the things. So those are the few cultures to uh, towards the south, uh, towards south. But especially towards the north, east, or west, we don't have a serious uh, issues with it. But sadly, at times, at times actually, uh, the, the support that women need to receive during the menstruation. The five days, of the, especially, we, I will call it the five days of critical days of the woman's life in a month. I think this is where the women need to help uh, more. Uh, sorry, men need to help more and support women. So I was just telling uh, in my earliest, earlier statement, 30 days women, I think, help us. They help, help us it with the household chores to keep everyone fit at home. But when they need us most during the five junk days of the juncture in their life, I think, this is where we feel actually. And uh, uh, the, now, uh, basically, what interesting, previously I was, I was of the same thought actually, and at home, we would not talk much about the menstruation. Even with wife, I would not talk much, keep aside my own daughter, we would not talk much. But after joining mm -hmm. the present office, I was just trying to flip some literature, go through some literature. And it's quite sad that uh, our girls, they don't have a proper, at times they, miss the classes because we don't, we don't have the proper wash facilities in the school uh, and we don't have a proper uh, the, 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 the place where they can change their, their, their sanitary napkins. So those are, so these are some of the ideas that I'm bringing in and uh, putting forward to our colleagues in the field. This is the area that we need to have more attention. Just uh, uh, three days, uh, a few days ago, we had a, a meeting with the education officers and they mm -hmm. have committed that every school now will have a proper sanitary napkin dustbin where they, they can keep the 
and they can dispose their nap sentry napkin. So those are the slowly that we are gaining the momentum actually. Although my colleagues in the past, they did their share of tasks. So I have now enough. Uh, I'm, I always tell my colleagues, I think we have enough share to do more to take the menstrual hygiene, normalizing the menstrual hygiene forward, actually. So uh, Shamisha Ji, that's what I feel about it, actually, as a man, actually. Uh, yeah, it will definitely come back to us more on the initiatives of the Bhutan uh, <laughs> government and also uh, many engage alliance that Lakshmanji is fired up. But uh, Lakshmanji was before talking about the root causes, like what are the root causes? The menstrual discrimination is there. We all accept it and we have acknowledged it. But what are the root causes? And also I would like to link it up that I, I was thinking about our last year's last December's um, conference on International Dignified Menstruation Day, where we also talked about patriarchy, how deeply rooted uh, it is in society like ours, and men has been exercising power over women, and women have little, um, you know, power to take like a significant role in making decisions like this one. Um, and even the book, uh, the Global South Coalition Dignified Menstruation even has a book where which Radha Powell has authored and uh, edited and many of us has contributed a chapter including Lakshmanji on that book. And even there also, we saw the discussion here and there on uh, how men and boys can be the part of this campaign. And there was also a few um, discussion highlighting the importance of involving men and boys mainly to construct the societal norms through dialogue of dignified menstruation. So let's um, discuss about some of the root causes. What do you why, what do you think are the root causes? Is it just the education? Is it just the patriarchy? Or there's more to that? And then we can come to a role of man. Like if, when we know the root causes, and definitely we can explore more on the role. What do you think? Yeah, Kormizi, would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah, I was uh, just uh, thinking uh, to focus on the root causes. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that menstrual discrimination is happening? Why is it still happening in today's world? And even in the developed part of the countries like we mentioned before, mm -hmm. what do you think are the reasons? Uh, from uh, my point of view, I think it's uh, how we grew up, the atmosphere and the climate that we grew up actually. So, especially in the Asian countries, uh, uh, the societal, the norms are almost same, actually, if you go around, actually. And uh, as a young boy, as I, as I mentioned earlier, as a young boy, uh, our, the mom, our elder sisters, they used to take things a little differently. And I think it's a little embedded in our culture that uh, menstruation is dirty, actually. So if we think with the same attitude, if we take with the same attitude, so way forward, then even our children, they are going to take the same way that we were uh, uh, taken those days, actually. So that's uh, mm -hmm. what I feel, actually. Uh, basically, it's, I think it boils down to our own culture, actually, and the uh, mm -hmm. way people think, actually. So uh, it that's is my thought just, uh, uh, it is just the lack of access to sanitary pads and menstrual products, uh, the fear of getting stained, the fear of uh, you know blood showing up in your clothes or and are we just linking that to like impurity or there's larger um, notion behind it Lakshmanji would you mm -hmm. like to comment on that is it just like sure. okay period blood is dirty because it's blood mm -hmm. and blood is something dirty is it mm -hmm. just that or there's more to menstrual dignity when we talk about these taboos mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think building on to what Karmaji said, uh, you know, the stigma and discrimination is also has to do with how our society is structured. And up around the world, it is structured with this system called patriarchy, which simply places, you know, men in the higher or hierarchy, uh, higher end of the hierarchy of power. And as Karmaji said, yes, you know, there is this particular five days, but the implication of what happens mm -hmm. to the women's body in five days has a ramification throughout the month, throughout the years and throughout life. True. Uh, the simple example of why, for example, if you look at the girl child uh, evolution from when they, they are born, it, before the 
puberty age, when they, before they start maturating, their body is considered pure and everyone goes on to say a goddess and then, you know, bring her to the, as if, you know, she would bring the whole lock to the society. But then as soon mm-hmm. as she enters the puberty, that goes away, which simply right. says that there is a connotation attached with this natural phenomena. And when, you know, the, 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 the maturation starts, then the patriarchy, you know, suddenly kicks off in the life of a woman and that goes throughout the life cycle. And if we look back a bit of how patriarchy generally operates and how patriarchy got introduced in this world also has to do with the control of sexuality of women. By because of this power that women have to give birth, and that's when the sense of powerlessness came in on men, and men started putting out this kind of structure in place that then you know, brings them or gives them the power to control the body of women. And, and that's the history. It, it goes back to 2,000, 3,000 years back. Some you know, uh, feminist activists and academicians have been able to trace back on how patriarchy was introduced. And it relates to this you know, basic fact that women are capable of producing human beings, whereas men don't have that capacity. And that sense of powerlessness was how patriarchy was you know, brought up because of the physical strength and, and the war factor that happened around that time. So the reason I'm saying this history is also because to bring in that it is not about what happens naturally in someone's body, but it is to do with how men have been sort of controlling what happens around women's body and who decides what happens with women's body and what ha- whatever happens get interpreted as in the, in the name of culture, in the name of religion, in the name of societal phenomena. And then that's how the domination of women and girls in general or menstruators in general, what we generally call within the Global South Coalition, just to be more inclusive, uh, what happens to menstruators throughout their life cycle. And this notion of this impure body then has a ramification in. So uh, throughout their life cycle, right? There are the phases where mm-hmm. every time women's body is stigmatized in our culture, in our structures, and then, you know, sort of, uh, that revolves around education, as Karmaji already mentioned. No, be, just because of what happens in the uh, during the puberty time, the, there is um, the statistics of over. You know, Karmaji said in Bhutan around fifty percent. The global figures goes around around sixty five percent of women and young women and girls, you know, are uh, have to leave their education because of the stigma and the harassment that happens around uh, menstruation. Uh, and it's not only about those four days and the availability of wash uh, facilities during those four days, because the teasing, and I, I also act, have to acknowledge, and along with Karmaji, right, we were part of that system where we created and played a big role as men in this the same culture where women and uh, girls would. And hence, for me, it's more than just what happens to the body, but it gets attached with the controlling of women's body and, and uh, controlling of sexuality, controlling of the bodily autonomy of women on who to have sex with, when to have sex with, or when to you know, be our children and so on. And hence it's more, uh, you know, the root causes as I see is rooted more around the patriarchal structure that we have, which revolves around power. And that also not only revolves around that, but has a ramification on the property issue, ramification on the citizenship issue, which is a hot topic these days in Nepal, for example. No, mm-hmm. So it has ramifications throughout, and then it continues until uh, someone is alive. So I think this is much bigger, very complex lifespan phenomena that happens and the discrimination and power imbalance. And that's the root cause, which is, which is what I see uh, as per my understanding. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like uh, even our discussion should uh, definitely focus more towards the fact that menstruation is definitely not just a biological phenomenon. It's 
more than that it affects us in several level and it has got to do so much with this power construction that lakshmanji explained it in a very simple and a very uh, in a in a nice way i would say and even if you like it or not uh, men they have been part of uh, menstrual issues like menstrual discussion uh, but in my opinion i think the role has been often been more in like uh, as an outsider than insider uh, so we definitely can do better so how do you think we can seek men's role from you know like i said before like menstrual bullies to menstrual mm -hmm. allies or from outsider to insider uh, from like somebody very inactive to like an active uh, campaigner what do you think we can do to enhance uh, the role of uh, men in this regard uh, karmaji do you want to add up um let's think at our own level actually at our own household actually uh, after understanding about the importance of menstruation so uh, normally i'll be often on a tour on the travels at times so i always tell my uh, uh, daughter uh, mom can the drive mom can the drive to the town so when it's time for the menstruation let me know because i'll have to keep your things ready before i leave so i please do not uh, Nike mom, she cannot drive. Those are the things that we talk actually, even to the wife. So when, so those days, a few days ago, uh, I think going to the town, buying a sanitary napkin, it was a little tough actually. <laughs> and we mm -hmm. did not feel good actually. But uh, my attitude towards the menstruation, it has changed a lot after understanding the importance of menstruation, how much women go through actually, despite I'm main almost with the now the mid forties actually. So I should have thought all these things way before actually it's late, but yes, nothing call a late in doing a good things actually. So uh, at home, if you have a daughter, okay, if you have a wife, if you have some uh, close relatives who menstruates actually, I think we should support them buying the menstruation uh, sentry napkins menstruation pads and all those things at the household level. At the bigger level, at the national level, I think we need to talk a lot about the menstruation hygiene, equalizing like uh, uh, the Lakshman Ji uh, clearly mentioned, the gender hierarchy that we have in our society, especially in the South Asia. I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, we need to understand all these things actually, especially as Lakshman Ji clearly mentioned, this must be the reason why, because women menstruate, they are at the lower, lower rung compared to the man. I think those things, I think we need to stop. Uh, we should, I think, if it, uh, as soon as possible. That's what I feel, actually. And uh, uh, at our level, as a man, I think we can do a lot, actually. And like um, helping women at uh, at the house, or doing a household chores when they suffer, isn't it? La? So these are the, some few things that we can think about at our level but and uh, at the policy level i think we are going to discuss later uh, right uh so yes. at the household level this is something i do actually so that mm -hmm. is the simplest way we can support each other actually and mm -hmm. uh, even to my colleagues in the office when i move around we talk a lot about it and uh, i think uh, i don't feel shy i should it's the natural thing even to my own daughter i talk i support her and whenever she needs me so i do, do uh, that i support her buying all those things stuff for her actually so i think this is simple way, simplest way we can do at our level i think let's start from the smallest mm -hmm. level actually Mm -hmm. So that's what I feel like, Jason. Yeah, yeah. When well, you, know, you were uh, saying, I was just <laughs> thinking that in a surface level, it just seems like you know we have these different hierarchies, there's gender inequality, yeah. and because of this, uh, uh, men's discrimination is happening. But when we dig deeper, it is actually the taboos and stigmas associated yeah. with it that is causing gender inequality, that is causing gender-based violence, child marriage, and many issues around gender. And Karamaji has explained it very nicely, like, you know, as a father, as a husband, like, the, all these things like seem like a very small ordinary things day-to-day -day chores okay. but all these small action can have a deeper meaning in power construction and more importantly in it will have a direct influence uh, in mainstreaming the agenda of dignified menstruation and the Lakshmanji is working mm -hmm. with various networks and alliances like men engage for um, instance so 
what do you do there actually? So what do you mean by the role of men and boys in gender justice? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, why do you think it is so important to involve boys and men? Because from various years, we have been focusing on the words like gender equality as something that exclusively belongs to women. Although mm -hmm. the word gender incorporates sexual and uh, gender minorities, men and women, of course. So could you please just share on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just also, you know, building on to what Karmaji said, no, I think we, we need to start it from ourselves. And the, when we talk about roles and responsibilities, and that's that's a very personal story of mine as well and mm -hmm. how I got involved in this work, no? If, if we look at how the stigma and discriminations are created and reconstructed and constructed and deconstructed around us to, during our own lifetime, if we think about how these things are structured is that first, the boys are not even allowed to understand what happens to the women's body, right? Sure. And there is a lot of stigma that this, you know, boys, you should not know about it. The reality is that even girls are told not to talk much about it and hence, you know, the, the understanding of what has happening to my own body is a big problem, let alone boys who are not even allowed to talk about it. And they keep on going around because that's the privilege men have. They, they mm -hmm. always are out. They keep going around to make these myths and stigma and discrimination that, that is created from the very early age. So if then men and boys are part of the problem where they are creating this kind of stigma, this kind of myths around women's body and building stories that then they say, you know, the body is impure and hence we are superior beings. And that's what boys are told from the very early days, right? So you're, you know, you are superior than your uh, sister if it's a family or you are someone else in your family. Or even when we, uh, so when Karmaji was saying, when he goes out, one story I remembered is that whenever someone, a father or a male figure goes out from the home, the person would tell if there is a small boy child in the home saying, now I'm leaving everything for, on, on your soldier, that you are then to be the protector. So these narratives eventually are implying to this men's and boy's mind that you are the superior being and the protector of the family. And that's how patriarchy operates. And that's why I was connecting that earlier with patriarchy, right? This giving the notion that you are the protector, you are the power holder of the family. And that's all that gets connected with controlling of women's body as well. You know, you are then supposed to control the body of women and what they want uh, or not want. And that gives a sense of how men come into the equation in the power hierarchy, then always men become dominant, and which is reinforcing. I'm not denying the role women also play in reinforcing patriarchal system. You know, uh, I am absolutely, but I think we need to look at, rather than uh, looking at whether women do or men do, we need to look at the systems and structures uh, perspective. So that's where the, the interest uh, uh, around men's being the superior being in the family revolves around how women also behave and uh, enact in particular relationship or particular scenario. And that we, we need to understand. And the roles when it comes to men and boys come in, if men go on to reinforce and develop this uh, myth and stigma around women's body, then it's also the role for men and boys to undo those myths and stigma that they are mm -hmm. our part in creating, right? And that's where the roles, and along with roles, we also talk about responsibility uh, comes in the play. And that's where men and boys need to come into play to deconstruct this stigma, the discrimination, the myths that are around or being created. And we, uh, as Karmaji said, we were part of that circle in the beginning. We used to make fun. We used to make jokes about it. We used to tease. So if we are part of that as a part of a problem, we have to take on some responsibility to sort of undo those things that we, we learned and bring that to home as well. And, and that's what uh, becomes the responsibility. Also not because we, are, we need to do as because we are fathers or we are husband. It is because our menstruators at home or my office or my community or my state 
you know, do have equal fundamental human rights to have equality and equal life as and dignity. And that's where the human rights declaration come in. No, that's why I was earlier saying it's a human rights issue is if you read the first sentence of human rights declaration, it brings the dignity in the front. And that's what we try to focus within the dignified maturation uh, discourse is that it's about dignity and rights of everyone or every menstruators. And the role that non menstruators play becomes equally important as well. So I'll stop there. I've been yeah, uh, no, no, that, that was very interesting. <laughs> Dr. Manji just uh, clearly entered into even our today's topic where we, be, we will be talking about Agenda 2030 as well, uh, because even in the UN's definition of uh, sexual and genderist violence, any form of menstrual discrimination is a form of this, um, sexual and genderist violence, and it is a violation of human rights. Uh, globally, there are many activists, there are a lot of advocacy groups who are working towards achieving these uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, but in my opinion, I might be wrong. I don't see menstrual dignity being prioritized that much. It's not there as one of the major agendas. So there has been a lot of emphasis on human rights, but uh, why isn't there any space on menstrual dignity? And even in um, this connection uh, from uh, Bhutan's government side, could you please say anything in regard to how you have been working to mainstream dignified menstruation. Do you think it is important to achieve our SDZ? Because even in the beginning, you said that there are many areas, sustainable development goals targets are directly related to, uh, you know, menstrual uh, dignity. So would you like to come into that, Karamaji? Um. Thank you, Shamak uh, Shaji. Basically, uh, the, the Global Agenda 2030, I think, uh, Goal 3 talks about uh, ensuring a healthy lives and the promote well-being of all ages, actually, all gender, basically, I think. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the, our context, uh, Bhutan government, uh, uh, with the blessings of His Majesty, it's doing enough, actually, to support our girls, actually. Uh, basically, at our level, our boys should unlearn and relearn about their menstruation. That's very important because mm -hmm. as uh, uh, the Lakshman G2, I think uh, the supported my stand where uh, the wee boys as a young uh, generation those days, uh, we used to make uh, fun of girls get, uh, when we see the menstruating. So I think uh, those concepts that had been embedded or coded in their thought should be, I think we need to unlearn it now. And mm -hmm. they need to learn about the importance of menstruation for the girls and how we should look at, as uh, you clearly mentioned about the dignified menstruation actually. And uh, even at our level, if you look at our context actually, often I refer to the, in the South Asian context because we almost have the similar culture. Even if you look at our own home actually, boys are okay they have little free the girls because you know, they need to wash the dishes they need to cook their okay meals these are the culture that we grew up with so which made our boys to feel that as uh, the Luxemburg clearly mentioned the gender hierarchy is already created when they were mm -hmm. young actually so okay. those are the something that we need to unlearn actually and uh, finally so at our level to fulfill the global agenda and aspirations of, of in our own way. So our government, every year we try to um, mark the menstruation hygiene day on 28th of May as a uh, Red Road Bhutan campaign day. So we now have the Royal Highness Prince, uh, Princess as our patronage. So those are the ideas that we are building slowly and slowly where our boys would normalize the menstruation and our girls would start talking about the menstruation to other share. Like uh, uh, the Lakshmanji clearly mentioned, I think uh, those were the days our girls will stop sharing about the menstruation to the other people. Even at times sharing to their own mom was difficult those days actually. So uh, keep us at our boys actually, even the girls themselves, they will stop those days actually. So taboos were created in both ways actually both male and the female boys and the girls like actually. So those are the time we had actually. So slowly and by slowly, I think it might take time to unlearn those ideas, but government with the blessings of his majesty, we are doing whatever we can 
too normalized in our own way. We are taking these ideas to our schools, actually, because a good number of our children are in the schools today, actually. Almost 100% of mm -hmm. our school going children, they are in the schools, actually. So those are ideas that, and every school on 28th of May, we mark the day uh, and uh, they would give the sanitary patch to their girls. Then the uh, Jen's teacher would give it to the lady teachers. So those are the ways that we can normalize this. So that's what uh, we are doing at our own level. So uh, I think you don't be far you. now. I think uh, we will have the, 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 by then it will be called as a dignified menstruation. Then we'll have the normalized menstruation. And those are the ideas that we are having in mm -hmm. our context, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, like even uh, Lakshmanji have also noticed that even when Karmaji was saying that definitely it, it takes time, you know, it is uh, uh, the deep rooted culture that's happening from like decades. So we just can't change it overnight. But again, definitely in an individual level in our day to day life, it can take time. But when we approach this agenda from the government side, like you said, from an institutional level, we can anticipate that we can hope that uh, we don't have to wait that long because when you mm -hmm. intervene as an institution that definitely makes difference rather than uh, some activists outside the government or outside any network um, campaigning the same thing and when the, some uh, powerful body as government incorporates in its agenda definitely it is bound to have more impact what do you think Lakshmanji mm. on that no absolutely no that is what also the aspiration of sustainable development goals are uh, and, and even the SDG does include the human rights language on, you know, dignity of everyone. Uh, but it doesn't have very specific mention about dignified menstruation or, or, or the rights of menstruators, even including the SDG 5, which is on gender equality, it doesn't talk sure. so much around the dignified menstruation as an uh, agenda that is of international concern. But despite it is not mentioned in the SDG. Uh, it can be connected with almost all of the uh, SDG goals that are there. I think um, wherever it, you know, out of this 17 uh, goals, and then, you know, which includes 169 uh, targets, there is not one on dignified maturation as such. But I think, you know, Radhaji uh, has been playing an amazing role in terms of meeting, making interlinkages, who is the uh, you know, lead from the Global South Coalition side, uh, that you know, there could be a lot of connections with regards to dignified maturation. And until and unless we address the issues of dignity and dignified maturation for all menstruators, the goals will not be met. So it, it uh, automatically aligns with education, uh, as Karmaji uh, was referring. So I think in, in if you look at our own curriculum or the curriculum around the world in school, not, you know, I have not come across in uh, around the world, a curriculum that includes a topic on maturation and the dignity around it. Uh, so it, it is important for institutions to start building those pieces in curriculum. Uh, there are, you know, sort of, it's important so that children and young people are educated and given proper information from the very early age. It can also connect with our other uh, uh, goals, uh, you know, uh, and we have mentioned that in the book that you referred uh, Samiksha Ji earlier, mm -hmm. but also with the gender, gender equality goal as well, the goal on partnership, the goal on uh, uh, hunger, you know, it, mm -hmm. it can relate to everything because what happens to the maturators during uh, the maturation and throughout the life gets connected with the aspirations that these goals and indicators have. So I think now what we are trying to do with, uh, within, from the Global South Coalition is to work with UN system to, for, to look at December 8th as the International Dignified Maturation Day, which needs to be then celebrated internationally and we are doing some advocacy work. So it'll be great to further have conversation with uh, and now with Bhutan as well, with other governments on how that can be possible. But one of the uh, points that we have, we tried to clarify in the declaration from the international um, conference that you, Samit Shaji, mentioned earlier, the first declaration or actually the call for action is that to, it's important to redefine the narrative on maturation from charity to human rights 
hygiene to dignity, impure to life giving, and from five days to a life course approach. And that is what we are trying to inculcate within the FTG framework as well. And it's relevance to, to not only look at this as a charity work that we are doing for women, uh, and which is basically, you know, that revolves around how the, the pads or sanitary pads or wash uh, programs generally revolve around. Uh, but I think we are trying to push that boundary a little more uh, to make it a human rights issue. And it's not that we are solving to women, but it is that we are trying to acknowledge and uh, give a clear message that women and girls are human beings, equal, if not more, to the rest. If you look at it from a life-giving perspective, women should be even higher in the power hierarchy, whereas the reality is the other way around. So I think we have to deep center our focus on more on the human rights factor rather than we are doing service to women or supporting women, right? It is that women and girls do not need support. They just need an environment where they are able to live the, their life free of discrimination, free of stigma, free of taboos, and free of fear uh, uh, of what happens to the body. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I completely agree with you. And uh, I remember Radhaji saying that when we were discussing about um, uh, these SDG goals and the menstrual stigma, she, I remember that uh, she, she told me that nine goals out of 17 mm. are directly linked to the issue of menstrual dignity. And that was when it actually hit me, you know, the mm -hmm. issue is definitely larger and it's global and it is not just one of the issues of the gender, but it is the issue. But having said that, um, knowing this too, you know, the dignified menstruation is a holistic approach to end all short of gender-based violence. And it is also very much or directly related to issue of sexual and reproductive rights the, as it focuses on promoting human rights. But having said that to uh, at least for us, we know that there is this, um, you know, critical need for the global recognition and awareness on uh, the that okay, menstrual dignity is uh, the issue directly related to human rights, but why do you think it's not happening till now? At least organizations like Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruations are trying their best. Rather, Podil, many activists like her, they are pioneer in this area and they have been putting a lot of effort. But in a global scale, what's happening? Where are we missing out on this? Or maybe it, is it because of the fact mm -hmm. that we don't? still consider this as the global issues and we just consider this as you know issue of india nepal or bhutan are we not even acknowledging it as a global problem yet your opinions uh shamiksha ji uh my straightforward answer would be i uh, think we need more of a people like you and radhaji who should talk about it actually and, and also uh, people like Lakshmi and Kormaji, yeah. as we are focusing on the role of men. Yeah, so uh, basically, although uh, it's an equal responsibility of men to support a woman, and, so, and on the other hand, I also feel that women should also not hide themselves from it, actually. That's equally important, actually, because as I mentioned, as even the uh, Lakshmi mentioned about the earlier, in our earlier conversation, the women, if they try to uh, more the more they try to expose and more they try to talk about it, then the others would accept it actually. From other end, men also should keep on supporting it. But from other end, women, if they stay, still stay as a taboo, then they feel stick, they are being stigmatized. They feel that we, they are not equal. If they take in that way, then they, those stand will remain in that way actually. So in a way, it should be from the both the end actually work together actually. So one way or other, I think we should play a role of equalizer here, equalizing the game here. So that's what I feel actually. And uh, uh, although there are many SDG goals, so of which I think two definitely one way or other, I think it points a finger towards uh, normalizing the menstruation, like uh, the SDG goal three, which talks about as, as the ensuring the healthy lives, and, and uh, the goal five, which talks about the equalizing and empowering all the women and girls. One way or other. Although there's no clear mention about the menstruation hygiene, but as 
and they, uh, as the global citizens, I think we need to understand it also talk about normalizing the menstruation actually and the dignified menstruation as you mentioned. So that's what I feel. It, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if for me, I just want to give my a small like experience or my opinion on this and Lakshmanji can definitely build up to that. Uh, I can't speak for, you know, the entire world or all the countries in the globe. Uh, but in uh, while working in this issue, when I was with the Women Ministry, and that's how I got connected with the Global South Coalition. And uh, I, that's how I came, uh, met Radha Podil during this uh, collaboration of the ministry. Um, I just felt that even in Nepal, we are so divided, you know, in the area of menstrual activism. The first step is that, uh, of course, when there's problem, we can find a solution. But when it comes to menstrual taboos, there is still a larger portion in our society who don't accept that menstrual stigma, menstrual taboos still exist. Some say that, okay, it happens in Brahmin, it doesn't happen in our caste. And there are other group of people saying that, okay, the menstrual uh, uh, stigma means uh, sending women to cow sheds, to menstrual sheds. We don't do that in Kathmandu, we don't do that in cities. Uh, it is just a problem of Karnali or it is just a problem of Acham. It is just a problem of people who are ignorant, uneducated. So for me personally, you know, because I, I was brought up in Pokhara and uh, in a quite educated family and I have like experienced menstrual discrimination like in a, in a very severe way, I would say. And growing up, it has affected me a lot in the way I think about myself, like the power construction that Lakshmanji is talking about. But even till a few years ago, even I would be, you know, bit reluctant to accept that you know I have experienced menstrual discrimination because that is not cool that's not being modern uh, so do you think part of the problem is that we are still hesitant to accept that menstrual discrimination is happening menstrual stigmas exist Lakshmanji or your thoughts on that yeah well, absolutely, it do. It, 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 it exists everywhere around the world. As I said before, only the severity of what, what is done to women during that period of time or menstruators during that period of time varies from culture to culture, place to place. Um, but also, you know, it's, it's the, the reason why this is so difficult to be uh, you know, included or brought up front is the fact that you know, when we talk about dignified maturation or the uh, equality issue, and it's the same for gender equality issue, right? It is, it is uh, never highlighted as it should be in the picture because it basically questions the power structure that, that is there in the global uh, landscape. Uh, let alone the, the uh, sort of uh, relational uh, aspect of gender, but also the structural, because if we look at structure and equality and dignity, then it is basically challenging the social fabric, which is very patriarchal in its essence, that we are challenging that. And that's mm -hmm. why at the global order, these systems, let alone you know, our family, but also the nation and state building, the, the global power order is very, very patriarchal. And if we are talking about then talking about equality and dignity of women and or menstruators or people who are at the margins of the margin, means that we are challenging those who are in the power hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, up in the power hierarchy. So that's why those who are in the power position never would like to give that power up. So I think that's what is keeping up. If look at the international uh, you know, discourse around gender equality or racial equality, for example, is because those in power do not want to give up. And hence in the negotiation, that happens in the UN spaces in advocacy work we do is that there is a denial at some level of keeping equality and justice and, and dignity for everyone and in equal sense. And that's where the equity and issues around the justice comes in. But I think that's the main reason is that, you know, there is that power structure in place that doesn't allow or give flexibility or those mm -hmm. in the power structures do not want to accept the equal for others. And that happens. And also the reason which is also included in the declaration from the international conference is that this work has been part of the international. So WASH 
you know, the, the menstrual sanitary pad services and so on has been part of the international development work. And the international development work is very much driven by the donors and, the, and, and it is not even the agenda in the donors level, uh, let alone the governments. You know, governments are patriarch in, in our, you know, the way they are structured. So that's why it doesn't come up in at the national level or even at the international level. But I guess, you know, the, the, it's, it's everybody business that we need to deconstruct the stigma and, and discrimination or myths around, uh, around uh, menstruators and their bodies, uh, but also look at the role of those who are in the higher in the power mm -hmm. hierarchy. So it's not only about, you know, women need to speak up, but also looking at do, do yeah. we, all, all of us, have created an environment where those who have been experiencing such discrimination, trauma throughout their life cycle are able to come out and speak freely. That's the question exactly. to me is, and that's where the role of men come in, is that men, we have been dominating the public spaces. We have been dominating these negotiating tables. We have been dominating this, you know, you name it, it's men who are dominating or even mm -hmm. the state. And that's mm -hmm. why I think the role of men and boys is to give that and create an environment where women and girls or menstruators can just simply come in and express their concern from the deepest of their heart and their what they, they want. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that, but it's it's in practice is difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah it's that, that that's that's you you uh, just uh, said it uh, nicely actually, and I was just relating my experience when you were sharing that. You know, it's not just about sharing your. You are, it's not just about telling about your menstrual um, experience, but it's more important that whether or not we have this environment. So maybe uh, it was the fact that I didn't feel comfortable with my male colleagues. I didn't feel comfortable with my male boss to talk about uh, menstrual related issues because I thought, you know, it will be further stigmatized and they won't be sensitive enough. They will not understand. So I think the openness, like, and uh, also the fact that, uh, even as a woman, we need to understand that the role of men is very important. We just can't think that, okay, it's a women issues. So we should work together to end this. Definitely with this approach, we are not going any far. Um, so I think it is also important when we talk about the role of men, uh, it won't be fair if we don't talk about the issues related to trans men. Uh, I was reading this report, um, research report from Global South Coalition from Dignified Menstruation, I think it was just yesterday or day before. And one of the findings uh, said that trans men in particular are even more hesitant uh, when it comes to buying these menstrual products or to talk about anything around menstruation. Uh, it was mainly because they thought that, you know, they will be asked some weird, awkward question from these people in the pharmacy or shopkeeper, wherever they are buying their menstrual products. So where do you think a trans men stand in menstrual activism? Or let's say, do you think our discourse around menstruation is inclusive enough? If not, uh, how do you think we can make it more inclusive? Uh, who wants to go first? Any one of you, please. Uh, uh, basically, Shamik Shaji, uh, we don't have that issue seriously in our country, <laughs> basically. But uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, as I mentioned in that, my earlier talk, that uh, I think it shouldn't be abnormal for someone to buy a sanitary napkin from the shop, be it man, be it woman, be it anybody, actually. So that's what we need to understand as uh, uh, the global citizen today, actually. So that's what I feel about it, actually. Uh, okay, uh, Lakshmanji, over to you. Uh, what would you stand, what's your stand on it today? Sure. So, yeah, I, I actually don't know around uh, trans men's involvement in the dignified menstruation uh, yeah. as a as a activism. But I think, you know, what I do know within the discourse on masculinities, uh, it's an in mm -hmm. interesting intersection of trans men, uh, you know, who are menstruators as well, and their involvement in the agenda that is not masculine uh, if mm -hmm. they want to prove them as men, right? Or male yeah. identified people. 
So it's an interesting uh, piece where we need to have more conversation with uh, how trans men feel about it. But from a masculinity's lens, uh, or the masculine they are in, because at the same time, they are supposed mm -hmm. to prove that they are men. And menstruation is so much attached with the feminine side of their things. And hence the, the, the point where they, you know, they don't want to be involved so much in the conversation on dignified maturation, whereas their struggle or the politics is around them being accepted as who they feel they are, rather than what their body looks like. So I think it's the matter of politics, what is important at this point in time for trans men to be more visible in, but mm -hmm. rather I think we need to be, once we think we, we normalize this so-called masculine versus feminine phenomena and diffuse them a bit, it may be more helpful and enabling environment for them to be more vocal about because the struggle that trans men have is, is, is more, there is other important pieces for them to be accepted for than them mm -hmm. being involved too much in the dignified maturation agenda at the moment. I think there is a bigger piece obviously gets connected with uh, the female body or feminine norms being associated with maturation, we, you know, I would wish them to be more involved in this uh, movement or activism moving forward. But I guess it's we'll have to see how we can create that space for trans men to be more involved and bring in this deconstructing masculine ideologies in this power hierarchy. Because in the patriarchy system, the masculine norms and ideologies play a very important role in keeping up with the power structure between women and men, if we talk about gender binary, but if we talk about gender as fluid concept across, mm -hmm. across the people who are in the different positions of power hierarchy. And, mm -hmm. and, and we need to bring that in a bit more so that we can be more inclusive, but ultimately within the Global South Coalition uh, um, activism, we do want to have trans men to be more involved and talk about dignified maturation so that it doesn't only become issue of women, but also broadly and challenges the gender binary language that we generally often use at men versus women. Mm -hmm. But actually, the men, that's where the menstruators comes in is that it is more inclusive. And that's why we, we have been using the word menstruators so that we can in, be inclusive of dignity of people who do not necessarily identify women in traditional terms, right? Mm -hmm, so exactly. that's the point we are trying to articulate more. And we wish, wish to uh, bring that diversity as, as much as possible, absolutely. Yeah, like you said, definitely moving away from this concept, like you know, gender is not just a male and female, it is not a binary concept, but it is a social construction and mm -hmm. gender should be understood largely as a fluid concept. And then only I think we can incorporate um, people representing gender and sexual minorities in uh, this agenda. Uh, I think we are coming towards the end of the webinar. So uh, for all our participants watching us live on Facebook, I would like to request if you have any particular concerns, questions, or any sort of recommendations that you think that would work on regard to our topic, we extremely welcome that. So please feel free to drop your comments. And if there's any particular question, we would be interested to address that. And we have our speakers who have been sharing their amazing experience in this journey of dignified menstruation. And I'm sure they will definitely have more to share. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, we will go towards the recommendation and we will be focusing on you know, what is the way forward. But before that, again, I want to come back to your uh, organizations, the organizations that you are representing, and especially with Karmaz is representing the uh, royal um, government of Bhutan. So it would be very uh, important for us to know, you know, what sort of, you have highlighted few of the programs. So I think we would be more interested to know what sort of programs and activities uh, uh, you, you have been part of in addressing menstrual inequality and discrimination. And also one more thing, why do you think we need more men like you in the government to address this issue? Because I know you have been doing an amazing job. Okay, uh, Shamiksha ji, uh, basically the Red Dot Bhutan campaign, uh, it uh, dates back to 2015, where we had uh, uh, 
uh, where we had a team, let's end the, and, uh, end the hesitation around the menstruation. So thereafter, we took off uh, the importance of menstruation. And although we had uh, uh, the program in a bits and pieces uh, before that, but uh, from 2015, we took off uh, uh, on a serious uh, note, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, then, the, as I mentioned earlier, so on every uh, 20th of May, uh, we uh, mark uh, the menstruation hygiene day uh, through the Red Dot Bhutan uh, campaign. Actually, uh, from uh, this year, this year uh, we have uh, uh, Her Royal Highness uh, Princess, uh, one of the princes, as our patronage, and uh, it, it took off at uh, the higher level of the people and they understood more the importance of the menstruation and taking it a little seriously. The man supporting it, so that's how. So I think. Uh, uh, 2021 uh, had been a very landmark uh, for uh, the, the Red Dot Tan campaign in our country, actually. So coming back to your question, actually, uh, I think uh, like uh, the, the Luxman G and me, there can be many people, many men who want to work, actually, and uh, definitely uh, the, there are the men even in our uh, Red Dot Tan uh, campaign. We have the man working for it, actually. So uh, by and by, I think people will embrace it. By and by, every man will think that this is a normal actually. And by and mm -hmm. by, hopefully, uh, not far from uh, uh, the, the this year, we uh, will have more men thinking uh, on the same page with the same thought and uh, working towards the same direction. And finally, mm -hmm. we'll have more of a, a people like Alexmanji and me thinking about that menstruation is mm -hmm. normal and it it should be considered and every woman should be treated equally, uh, especially mm -hmm. during the menstruation, mm -hmm. we need to work together and reach our heart and hands actually. So mm -hmm. that's what I feel like, that's what we dream actually as uh, the Red Dot uh, uh, Bhutan campaigner actually. So that's what our Thank aspirations you. are. Thank you, Karmaji. And I'm being a little more ambitious here since we are from Ministry of Education. And even Lakshmanji was uh, uh, stating that before that we have been able to incorporate a chapter on dignified menstruation in as a part of our curriculum. So in case of Bhutan, in near future, do you see a possibility? Can we see a chapter around menstrual restriction or dig menstrual dignity? Or do you have it already? Like, can it be a part of your curriculum in the school textbook? Okay, uh, Shamiksha ji, basically when we talk about the mainstream curriculum, we do have a certain session on it and we do have every, the higher second school and the middle second school, we have a school counselors actually, where they give talk on the importance of MHM, the importance of taking care of themselves during the menstruation period. We do have all those things in bits and pieces, but on the serious note, we are seriously thinking, uh, uh, getting it incorporated in our mainstream curriculum. I think uh, somewhere down the line, definitely it's going to happen. And I assure you that uh, uh, with uh, the, the MHM getting momentum globally, globally, mm -hmm. I think Bhutan too will join the global curse and for the curse of a woman, definitely. And yeah. as you mentioned, mainstream curriculum is one place where our children should learn actually, definitely. Exactly. And uh, definitely it will be, uh, lead to the safety of our young girls it will lead to the safety of the young birth our girls giving a child the young birth and definitely as i mentioned the, as the stand of the uh, the discussion here definitely we will have the dignified menstruation and finally towards normalizing the menstruation in our society and the globally so that's what I feel. Mm -hmm. And with somebody like you at the ministry, I can definitely see hap it happening in near future. So let's really hope that, you know, uh, the dignified menstruation can be mainstreamed and it can also be the part of like the pro proper curricula in Bhutan and of course in the rest of the world too. Uh, so uh, to, towards Lakshmanji, so as you have been part of many Engage Alliance, what do you think that organizations and network alliances like men Engage do? Because uh, you, you told me before that, you know, the role of men is very much important in deconstructing the standard societal norms or gender norms that is actually causing menstrual discrimination so what do you think um, organizations like Men Engage Alliance do in deconstructing these gender norms so finally we can get rid of mm -hmm. menstrual discriminations? 
Absolutely. So I think, yeah, there is so much that, you know, Meningiz and our, our members also need to be doing in this uh, area. But unfortunately, there is not much happening at the moment uh, within Meningiz Alliance and uh, the members we do uh, have currently. But there are increasingly, um, you know, some members who are interested to start work on this. So we, we are expecting more work that may evolve. So very concrete recommendations when it comes to the work with men and boys. One is, you know, I would definitely urge everyone who is listening as well to sort of refer to the declaration of the second international uh, workshop that we organized last year. Uh, we have clarified the politics and how this work should look like um, there. But I think, you know, one of the things is that we definitely need to move away from services to the to human rights as a work, but also on, only looking at not as an international development work as it is understood at the moment, which is very, very global north driven on the agenda. And as Global South Coalition, what we are demanding is that Global South actually can also take lead and become the role model globally. So we are definitely looking at you, uh, Karmazi, uh, you know, uh, and, and in Nepal, uh, you know, we are trying as well, and other countries we are trying, but I guess, you know, having you, Karmazi, here would be extremely helpful. You know, Bhutan could be the lead on bringing in this uh, up in the international discourse. So that's where I think most of the time, rather than waiting for what others do and then we will do, it's time for Global South groups to actually take lead and so that we are actually quite forefront or at the fore when it comes to the human rights agenda and acknowledging the human rights for all women and girls in our countries and globally. Uh, the, the other point on the work with men and boys, it's important to highlight, yes, definitely, we want men and boys to be involved in this work, but uh, as much as we are discussing around why, the, the actually the discourse has moved on from why to how. So how are men and boys involved? So men, we, we want men and boys on board, but work under the leadership of women and girls and menstruators so that the agenda which impacts the people the most or the group the most have the space to take the leadership role. And we play more supportive role and role of allies and, and uh, stand in solidarity with the agenda. So that's something very, very important. And that is what we call accountability for men and boys is to also accept and work under the leadership of those who are at the margins of the margin if we are talking about rights and justice. And that's how the responsibility of men and boys come in, in addressing and challenging the patriarchal root causes but take a responsibility and inform what we will do as men and boys from the interest and content from those who are experiencing it there throughout their life cycle. So that suddenly men, there is a, this tendency, you know, when men start being involved in the work, then suddenly men become the lead. And that's how patriarchy has been operating. So it's not about reinforcing male superiority in this work. It's about challenging the male superiority in our essence and work under the leadership of maturators. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is extremely important to believe in, bring in mind. And it is important to also look at it from a, um, a, a you know, life cycle perspective, whereby it is everyone who are working on human rights need to come together. So it's not that you know, some say you will do your part in Nepal, I'll do some part here, Karmaza will only do in Bhutan, but it's time for building solidarity and come mm -hmm. together as much as possible. And that is what we try to do within Mening Gaze is we bring everyone together in the same platform where we can mm -hmm. challenge, we can consult, we can have conversation and become better and stronger together to push back against the kind of systems that are there and uproot the root causes of injustices that menstruators have been facing or face throughout the life cycle so that we can actually push that agenda forward and bring it to the global discourse. I think that's the only role and that's what Global Coalition is trying to do, South Coalition, is to bring that discourse under the leadership of those living in Global South to showcase that this kind of human rights agenda 
can be led by those in the global south as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not that global north countries are better off. Global south countries can be better off and can be uh, in, in the leadership role as well in this kind of human rights agenda. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's quite a lot, yeah. but those are the recommendations. <laughs> yeah, that totally makes sense. And I remember that you even contributed a chapter uh, in uh, this book uh, oh. where the title was Dignified Menstruation, Our Human Rights Agenda and the Role of Boys and Men, where you, you have also shared your experience of childhood mm -hmm. and you have also recommended a very useful uh, points are actually the way forward just like first step being awareness raising is the first step at the individual level and mm -hmm. you should start from your own home it's important to break the silence mm -hmm. debunk the myths and stigmas promote accountable alliances with men and boys develop programs and advocacy efforts and strengthening human rights inform the legislative frameworks and uh, i think uh, all these recommendations are very important to bring men and boys on board and to end uh, all sorts of uh, discrimination around menstruation and for those of you watching us live on facebook if you don't have this book uh, this is a book a uh, practical handbook uh, on dignified menstruation the dignity of menstruators throughout their life cycle edited and compiled by radha podel uh, and uh, in this book it has just when we were talking about you know this solidarity people from everybody coming together i think this book is a fantastic example Mm -hmm. as there has been 40 contributions from more than 20 countries and um, uh, there has been numerous kind of experiences of both menstruators and non-menstruators keeping uh, the dignity of menstruators in uh, the center so i think this book definitely marks a mm -hmm. milestone in changing the narrative of menstruation at individual family society and global level and thereby in achieving the goal of an equal society in Quiz. Menstruators do not have to feel ashamed by this most basic uh, uh, function of life. And as we come towards the end, uh, let's hear from Karmaji as well. Like uh, we are going to observe um, third International Dignified Menstruation Day on 8th of December. Uh, so I think we also need to focus on, you know, what sort of agendas or what sort of issues we should be focusing on on these international. Uh, dignified menstruation day the upcoming one and also any sort of recommendation and if, would you like to you know highlight any way forward so in order to promote the role of men and boys in promoting dignified menstruation uh Shaji, i think uh, the global south is doing a great job actually uh, so after my connection with the Radhaji. So I had been learning a lot, actually, definitely. As I mentioned, it's just uh, one year uh, old in this office. So it always uh, gives me a platform to learn. And uh, after I got connected with uh, the Global South and with the Radhaji, so uh, I think I have learned a lot, actually, basically. And uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the agenda that uh, the, 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 I'm thinking about, uh, how about uh, globally, I think uh, I our thoughts should be aligned to the what's in the SDG. It's clearly mentioned, although uh, it, uh, it, uh, uh, there can be a deviation in thoughts, but if you are to really uh, look through the lens, I think the, the SDG, uh, uh, especially the goal, the three and the five, clearly I think it channelizes about uh, the normalizing the menstruation actually, if we are to take it a little uh, seriously and in a clearer note actually. So this is what I like to think about it. Uh, so we can, uh, I think, uh, channelize our uh, the agenda towards it. Actually, this is one thought. And uh, the, I was just going through a few uh, the articles and uh, the clips of the Global South. I think it's doing a great job, actually. That's what I like to reiterate again. And uh, at, uh, uh, so the context uh, can be different. But uh, when it comes to the Bhutan, especially as I mentioned earlier, the many of our girls, girls young girls, and the boys, I think they grow up in the atmosphere where the things, if you are to take in the same thought that we had in the past, they will grow up with the same mentality. So that's where we need to break the chain actually. So in the school, I was uh, talking to my uh, the uh, education officer colleagues a few days ago during one of the meeting, at least have the changing room where then this is how our boys will start accepting changing room for the girls during the menstruation. 
So this is a normal thing. When we have a normal, simple structure like a changing room, then boys will definitely embrace it. Oh, these are the things that's normal for our, uh, our girls actually. So have the sentry pads ready at the school actually. Menstruation is something that it might happen okay, anytime for the girls. So have those things. So those things. And even as I mentioned earlier, during the time of menstruation hygiene day, which we celebrate on the uh, 20th of the May, April, during that time, let the girls get the gift from the boys. Let the boys give this menstrual pad to the girls. So these are the simple way we can uh, take in to normalize it. So globally, I think these are the ideas that we can share and even the uh, the globally, uh, uh, the, uh, they can take the idea from the Bhutan. So uh, we, mm -hmm. our education officers recently, they have made a commitment Okay, hereafter, every structural plan that we have, there will be a changing room. So those are the things, the step by step, although it's slowly, but surely we are going to a right direction, actually. So that's what we, and uh, finally, my uh, uh, biggest uh, thank you to the Radaji and the Global South for connecting me and uh, more than me giving to the, 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 the viewers just now, I think I'm learning a lot from the, uh, the people like uh, the Lakshmanji and you actually, and definitely our other chief actually. So those are the submissions that I would like to make actually. Basically, it always, uh, there's a clear mention of three, uh, special goal three and five in SDG. The one talks about the ensuring the healthy life, one talked about the equity, of the gender equity. I think it's very clearly, a bit, so we can draw from that uh, the wisdom where we need to hit actually. So mm -hmm. that's what my thought on it actually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karmaji, for all that uh, commitment and recommendation. And Lakshmanji, is there anything you want to uh, say at the end? Mm -hmm. Let's work together. Sure, we, we should can, totally. We can bring the change. Yeah, no, definitely. As human rights lie at the core of the 2030 agenda, and we have been envisaging uh, a world of universal respect and human dignity, equality, and non discrimination. And we definitely can't be a part of a world where menstruators are discriminated. And we discussed on the role of men and boys in particular in this um, episode of webinar. And let's do our part uh, to end this discrimination. Let's work together to bring more men to work on this issue and on behalf of global south coalition for dignified menstruation i would like to thank our both amazing speakers and uh, we are very glad we are thrilled to know about your contributions and we look forward for a similar contribution in the days to come thank you so much for your time okay thank you thank you all the viewers thank you thank you thank you namaste goodbye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.